This is episode number 37 of the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome to this week's episode. My name is Dylan. Thank you very much for joining me. In November, so last month, we hit a massive download record for the podcast. We actually crushed the previous record by over 150%. So thank you very much. If you were somebody who listened last month, clearly you guys are sharing the content with other people in the community, and I deeply, deeply appreciate that. If you are looking for ways to support the show otherwise, of course, always sharing it. Sharing it within the community is the biggest thing you can do, but you can also leave a review or a rating on the iTunes podcasting app that always helps me out. You can head to animalsathome.ca slash shop and pick yourself up a t-shirt or a sweater. $5 for every t-shirt or sweater does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy or ARC. Last month, I was actually able to make about a $75 donation. That was a collection of a few months of worth of donations to the charity. So I think now we're over 200, maybe $240 or so donated to that charity. So that I'm super proud of. That's very exciting. And the final thing you can do is go check out the show's sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. There are links in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. They do have access to everything you need reptile related, maximum reptile enclosures, universal rock, Miss King, the list continues to go on, bio dude, there's a man, many different great products uh, with customreptilehabitats.com. And if you do end up purchasing something through one of my links, I will get a commission and you will in turn be supporting the show. On this episode of the podcast, I'm chatting with Kate Gore, who is one of the herp keepers at the Chattanooga Zoo in Tennessee. And of course, as a reptile enthusiast, you will love just listening to what her day-to-day job is. It sounds incredible. It is a dream job, I believe, for any reptile enthusiast. So that is highly interesting. But the main point of this conversation was to discuss the zoo's current attempt at breeding Komodo dragons. Now, the AZA, or the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, has a program called the SSP, the Species Survival Plan. And the Chattanooga Zoo has been selected as one of the zoos to attempt to breed Komodo dragons. So we talk all about that. They did actually hatch three Komodo dragons in August. These may not be the result of a successful mating. So you will listen to all about that. It uh, has to do with virgin births and parthenogenesis, which is highly interesting. So we do discuss that as well. And we also get into a new species of, I shouldn't say a new species, a vulnerable species of snake neck turtles that again is part of the SSP that Chattanooga Zoo has just recently hatched as well. This conversation really outlines the importance of zoos and the important role that they can provide and how important it is to keep them healthy and thriving in our culture. Enjoy the episode. All right. Well, Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. I, uh, as soon as I saw the articles a few months ago, just regarding the, the fact that the Chattanooga zoo had actually hatched some Komodo dragons, I knew I had to chat with somebody from the zoo. So, and also the fact that you are a herp keeper at a zoo and simultaneously get to work with Komodo dragons. I think you're checking off a lot of those dream boxes on many people's lists. So hopefully we can kind of vicariously live through you, uh, through a little bit here. As far as your story is concerned, was working uh, with animals in the capacity that you are now something that you have always wanted to do? Uh, Yeah, I have always been interested in animal care. And growing up, I loved visiting zoos. So being able to work with those same animals, it was a dream come true for me. And I know that you initially had started, uh, I think it was the first zoo at the Sacramento Zoo, and now you've moved to Chattanooga. Yeah. Yeah. I worked at Sacramento Zoo for almost 13 years and then came here just about six months ago. So are the roles very similar or so what type of things are you doing on a data basis, uh, day-to-day basis? Uh, basically, the most important role, checking in on the animals, making sure that everybody's alive, okay, and happy. Once that's all squared away, then we go out, we get the diets that we need to feed them, um, you know, make clean up after them, all the normal stuff like you would do with a, a household pet, you would do for these guys. Um, and then also making sure that something to keep them occupied, giving them enrichment, whether it's toys or a novel food or changing their environment, um, all of those things. Um, and then also training them, uh, training different animals to do different things so that we don't necessarily have to handle them. Like if we're taking them to the vets or something akin to that, we can have them go willingly with us by letting them, training them to go into a crate rather than just picking them up and carrying them. 
Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Are, are most of the animals that you work with, are you guys able to crate train most species? I know obviously Komodo dragons, that's a big one, but are, are there other animals that you guys do that with as well? Oh, yes. Um, we actually do a lot of training with the Komodos, mostly target training right now. And if we had a larger crate, we could probably train them to go into one. But uh, yeah, most of our lizards, we could crate train if we need to, you know, for the larger ones, such as the rhino iguanas. Um, the snakes aren't necessarily crate trained per se, but we could get them to go into, say, a feeding box if we wanted to. And getting them used to that whole idea would actually be considered crate training, I think. Um, so, yeah, quite a few of the animals. Yes. Yeah, I know that... Um we always talk about sort of training animals on the show and snakes are always the sort of slightly out of the box in a way where they almost have to train them or you have to look at them in a different way and they seemingly can still be trained. They're just not going to look the same as a typical lizard would. Yeah, exactly. They, they don't necessarily do the same things. They won't so much catch on as quickly if at all. And I think a lot of it has to do with the individual snake too. If they're interested, if they want to do something, it all comes down to their idea. Yeah, exactly. And I know listening to you talk about enrichment, are there certain cues that you guys can, that you take from the animals that tells you, okay, we need to add more enrichment into this enclosure? Um, I think with them, you, you kind of look at them. Are they just sitting there doing nothing all day and that's abnormal for them? Uh, do they not really show any interest in anything? You know, maybe it's something to get them to show a natural behavior that you might see in the wild, you know, with, for instance, the Komodo dragons. If we hang a cow leg from the ceiling, we're going to see them grabbing and ripping and tearing like they would a water buffalo back home. So having that here gives them that chance to show that natural behavior. Yeah, that's, uh, it's really interesting. One of the sort of the founding messages of my show is that I really try to promote that environmental enrichment to produce natural behaviors. And I think that's something that people can do. You can learn a lot from a zoo and people can do it with their animals in their own homes, like just like a pet, like you were saying earlier. So what are, what are some other ways you guys enrich? Is it mostly a feeding enrichment or are there some um, just different things that the animals can sort of quote unquote play with in their enclosures? Oh yeah. Uh, so we might add some, say, uh, different branches so that they can climb up into different areas than they normally would, or just adding just the different branches or so something new that smells different, um, giving them a different type of substrate. You know, a box of sand might be totally interesting to a snake rather that's used to mulch as a substrate. Um, uh, our our young baby Komodo dragons, they actually have a playroom where we've put in all sorts of different items where they can run on a on a box into a box of sand they can climb up a branch and you know they they have a blast and they're you know playing around for an hour on different stuff so you know it all depends <laughs> yeah it, that's the interesting thing about reptiles is you know so often they're painted as you know they just sit around and do nothing but i always that's the one thing i find so amazing is when i add anything new to an enclosure it takes just a few hours for them to be either the snakes or the lizards to go investigate it you know it could be something as simple as different you know leaf litter or different substrate they know how their surroundings look like typically and they know when something's new yeah exactly and giving them that opportunity to do something like that is always a great feeling oh definitely yeah exactly so let's chat about this Komodo uh, dragon breeding project. So uh, I, I think the the actual, I guess I had a few questions. The first one was, do you know how many zoos are currently working trying to captively breed Komodo dragons? I know there's a few, but there's not too many. Yeah, it all depends on, on space, really. I and mean, if you don't have much space to hold more than one Komodo, you're not going to want to breed them because you're not going to have anywhere to put them all. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know off the top of my head the number of zoos that are actively trying to breed them. I, I know for sure, obviously we are, and then Memphis Zoo is a big, big proponent of Komodo breeding as well. Uh, those two off the top of my head, LA's done some too. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know exactly how many. <laughs> yeah, it, it's obviously, it's not a huge number. I know that's, like you said, the size is obviously a big factor in, in being able to breed them. And I know the, I was hoping you could just chat a little bit about the species survival plan or the AZA has that program and maybe you could just chat a little bit about what that was or what that is and then how it's kind of allowed uh, the Chattanooga Zoo to breed Komodo dragons or at least attempt to anyway. 
Yeah, the species survival plans, they're an animal management system where basically the ultimate goal is that every zoo or any zoo that has a specific species of animal, the goal is that we will have them to be a sustainable population for at least 100 years. Now, it's a very hard goal to reach, but, you know, we, we, we like impossibility, so we can try that. So in the case of Komodos, what we want to do is we want to set them up with you know, getting the specific genetics in place so that down the road, we don't have to go, oh no, we only have so many. If we actually put them all together, then there's going to be inbreeding. The ultimate goal is to not have to worry about that, to not go, oh, we're going to have to, you know, look at wild caught animals or anything like that. We don't want that. So we basically, the SSP involves bringing in a stud bookkeeper. Um, I am actually not for Komodos, but for black tree monitors. So in that case, what I would do is I look at all of the different uh, black tree monitors out there and I put them in this stud book that lists who's who, who's related to who, all of that. I get it all recorded every bit, at least every two years. And then at that every two year mark, when I have it all figured out of which ones are where, how many zoos have them, which, how many each zoo has, then I talk to a population biologist, usually based out of Chicago, and they actually will go through all the genetics and do all of the scientific work that is kind of above my head. And then they actually will run a little breeding and transfer plan. Now this plan will tell all the zoos, okay, zoo A over here has two different male and females. They would like to actually breed them. These ones aren't really doing it. They aren't the best uh, genetic match. So zoo B actually has a perfect female to match with zoo A's male. So we can go ahead and trade them and then they'll trade them, hopefully breed and bring in new blood to the species. And if it all works out, then they become what's called a green SSP where they're doing really well and they become sustainable. So is the idea to sustain them in captivity or is a, is the eventual plan to try to release some of these animals back into the wild? Obviously, these are, I think all the animals involved in the SSP must be endangered in the wild. Is that right? Not necessarily. There are some that, well, we don't know for sure. So black tree monitors, we aren't entirely sure if they're endangered or not. The population's unknown, really. But with ones that are critically endangered, there is a thought that maybe down the road some can be released. When it comes down to it, a lot of the zoo populations, unless they're brought up in a completely clean environment where they aren't really dealing with people too much, they aren't going to be released, even if there was space to release them. I mean, that's, that's a huge issue. You look at tigers and such, you know, tigers, they're breeding them. They do fine in captivity. They can't really release them because there really isn't that much space for them. So as a result, we just kind of keep them here. And with Komodos, their populations aren't terrible right now in the wild. However, they're just in limited areas. They're in only in certain islands. So as a result, we can't go and release them on islands uh, just because, well, they would be in, in a different island and probably be an invasive species at that point. So we do have them. They would be, it would be more of what we call an assurance population. If for some reason the species failed in the wild, you know, a, a massive sickness killed them off or, a huge amount of development, like with the Kihanzi spray toads, then in that case, we get as many as we can out of the wild. We do the SSP for them with the entire thought of having that assurance population so that down the road, we can maybe put some back. And in fact, that is what happened with the Kihanzi spray toads. So there have been a couple like that that have been very successful. Yeah. Well, that's very cool, actually, because it, um, you know, you have this so the plan basically protects you. We have the assurance uh, population without them being completely inbred and, you know, breeding to the same animal. So if the event did happen where we needed to repopulate, we were going to have good, healthy genetics that can go into the world. Yeah. It's really cool. The idea of a stud book. And I wish that's something that the act, like the reptile hobby would take on more because people seem to sort of willy nilly breed, even crossbreed and hybridize. And there's never any sort of st- strict plan and we don't know what's what the blood gets very mixed so having a stud book would be really interesting for the hobby but so so that's interesting how that's how it works so in terms of the black tree monitors is that your domain in terms of all of the ssp for that species like your job is the stud book across the states yeah well actually across uh, the whole u.s i'm the stud bookkeeper and the ssp coordinator so i oversee the stud book 
and then I also look at the whole SSP and, you know, kind of, I don't, wouldn't say decide where everything is going to go because I do use my population manager for that. But, um, you know, they, if somebody needs them or if they want to talk about them, I try and give as much input as I can. Interesting. So that sort of takes us to the Komodo dragon. So the, the Chattanooga Zoo, did they have just one Komodo or one, one animal at the time, or did the second one come in through the SSP? Yeah, so we actually got, uh, we got Kadal, I believe it was, uh, I don't know exact, the exact time off my hands, but I believe it was at least five years ago. In any case, we had him for a while. We got Charlie just a couple of years ago. And so she actually was a stud book uh, recommendation. Uh, Kadal was actually brought in from overseas. He was part of a big trade that the U.S. did with the Czech Republic. They brought over some some of their lizards and we sent some of ours because ours were pretty well represented, but they weren't represented over there. And obviously Kadal's line was not represented over here. So we brought him in and then Charlie was a good match for him via the population management. And so they sent her to us and she has been doing great here, obviously. <laughs> so in terms of those, the history of those animals, did they come from the wild originally or are they captive bred in sort of where they came from? Oh, they were definitely captive bred. Mm, yeah, okay. so uh, Kadal was actually born in the Czech Republic. And then Charlie, she came to us from Akron, but it says that she was born in Toronto, I believe. So yes, they are both captive bred. And yeah. So then now that, so the two animals make it to the zoo, and then I believe a actual facility needed to be built for the animals to breed. Is that right? So we had the the original exhibit, and then when we were, knew we were going to bring Charlie in, we actually built this breeding facility, which is a lovely little setup that has you know an off exhibit holding spot both inside and outside, a pit where she can actually burrow down to lay eggs, a nice big old pool that she can swim in should she wishes to or just drink out of, um, and then even the outdoor one has a nice little area with all of the same things too, plus their outdoor exhibit. So. They have quite a few spaces they can choose from. And uh, what, what is it like working with these animals? Amazing. Um, it has been a dream of mine since I became a zookeeper to work with Komodo dragons. I've always been enamored with them. And I'm really lucky in the fact that these two are very, uh, I wouldn't say nice, because that, that's not a great term for it, but they, we can work closely with them. Uh, Charlie is accepting of us coming in and working around her and Kadal is too for that fact but uh, he he does tend to tail with occasionally so we have to be careful but uh, you know I've heard of a lot of places where they have to do protected contact or no contact at all because of the fact that their dragons tend to be a little bit more wild these two are very good with us they're they like to train with us and you know they're very curious about whatever we're doing in the area so I'm fairly lucky with that so in terms of their just the perception of their intelligence does it seem like they are a very obviously they're very inquisitive but like how far can you guys take them in terms of the training well so far I mean, we have them target trained so if we show them a target they know immediately that they go to that target they're getting food um i haven't gone much farther with that however i wouldn't be surprised if they can go farther they have shown their aptitude just for play behaviors where they want, they see something and it interests them and they'll move it around just because they can. Uh, so I bet they could learn quite a bit more. I've, I've asked them to kind of stand up for their target and they catch on to that very fast as well. So sky's the limit, I think, with them. Yeah, they're such an impressive species. I mean, just watching them move is exciting enough, let alone I can't imagine what it's, it's like working with them. Yes, it's, it really is amazing. <laughs> So in terms of the actual pairing, when you guys introduced these two animals together, that must have been, I don't know if you were at the zoo yet when this happened, but what, what was that like? I mean, that was probably a nerve wracking experience for the keepers. Yeah, the first time I, I, from what I hear, it was very nerve wracking. They were worried that he was going to basically, uh, you know, attack her for lack of a better term. Um, and he did chase her around. And at one point she hid under a log and he grabbed her. Um, um, but they were able to separate them and uh, then they did put them together a few more times. This last time when we introduced them this last year, 
honestly, I was amazed because I had just heard from other zoos that if you put them together, it will look rather violent because the males tend to sort of rake their claws on the females. They'll grab them. They'll bite them. And Kadal really wasn't that bad. He was actually very relaxed. In fact, the first two times we put him together, he fell asleep on her. So, you know, that was a little weird. But um, <laughs> then uh, when this last time, she actually somewhat pursued him and allowed everything to happen. And he was very gentle with her. So I don't know if we're just, we have some very nice dragons or what, but it appeared to work because it looked successful to us. <laughs> so in terms of if it does go south, do you guys have a plan of action? Like how do you, how would you break up two Komodo dragons sort of interlocked in a fight? We all, whenever we put them together, we always have three people and we will put, uh, we will bring out shields that kind of look like your riot shields for lack of a better term. Um, and then we also have very, very strong poles with a sort of a Y at the end. And so we will have that shield with us and that pole. And if they are locked up and we have to get them apart, we will use the Y pole to push one away from the other. And then once that's done, one person will try and get the other one to go into the building while the other holds the first one back. And thankfully, we haven't had to do that yet, but we're ready to if that should happen. Yeah, I guess that would be a pretty adversive experience for both you guys, but also the the dragons as well. That would be it might be tough to overcome that level of stress trying, you know, pairing them together. Absolutely. And they're very heavy and very strong, so it, it would not be easy. But if that's what we need to do, we would. Yeah, of course. And so so after this sort of successful what seemed to be a successful mating, uh, after that you kind of separate them again and you just sort of wait for Charlie to lay eggs. Yep. That's exactly it. We, we've been watching her. Um, we watch for her to see if she continues eating the same amount. If she starts turning down her food and she starts looking a little bit rounder, then we know there's possibly some eggs cooking in there. And, you know, fingers crossed, that's what we're kind of waiting on right now. And do you guys do any x-rays or anything of, of that sort? You know, we haven't. Um, it would be cool to do if we had a, a good ultrasound machine, especially a, one that we could move around, um, because the only way we really could easily do that is to bring her to the hospital and do a little uh, radiograph with her instead. We don't really have an ultrasound machine here. Um, but I would not be surprised if we would be able to do an ultrasound on her if we had the equipment. Right. So obviously, so now we're waiting to hopefully she has, uh, she's producing some eggs and the, the, the eggs that hatched in the, I think, was it, did they hatch in August or? Yeah. Mm. And those ones were they, were they, I know that there's a chance that they were parthenogenic. Were, were those at the result of what you guys thought was a successful mating? We weren't entirely sure they were successful at the time. And now seeing what was a successful mating, we're actually reasonably sure that it was not the first go around. Uh, so, and then also in talking with other zoos about having uh, parthenogenic uh, births before. Um, so yeah, we, we were looking at them and we only had four of them hatch. I'm sorry, three of them. <laughs> so um as a result, you know, usually it's only three to four will hatch out of a clutch when it's parthenogenic. And yet, if there's a full, a very good breeding, then generally they, uh, all of the eggs will hatch, which could be up to, you know, 30 eggs. So, you know, this time if we got 28 eggs, there would be a chance of 28 babies. That would be a lot. <laughs> so going back to the partho, Obviously, you guys found the eggs, and at this point, you're not sure because you've not seen a successful mating, and then you guys incubate them. How long did they incubate for? Uh, well, we found them um, basically, what was it, the day uh, after Christmas, I believe it was. So it was before I was here, but yeah, it was one of the days around Christmas, they found them, and they noticed actually that she was super thin again. She was ready to eat, which she hadn't been for a while. And so I said, oh, there, there might be eggs. So they moved her out of that den, dug down, found them all. And yeah, we incubated them with the hopes that, you know, we would see something. And over that time, we saw that, you know, there was just a few that actually looked good. Um, the others, you know, they might get moldy or they just didn't develop. We would candle them and see nothing in there. So 
in that time frame between then and well, I got here in mid May and we were looking at it and we were thinking, well, this could be the time anytime now. And so we just kept checking and kept checking. And by that point there were only the three left that were viable. So we kept the a look on those. And then one day I came in well, on the fourth and opened the lid and out ran a dragon up my arm and I went, Oh my goodness. <laughs> and it was an amazing day. Yeah. So, tell me about that. What, like, obviously that must've been incredibly exciting. Oh, it was, I was over the moon. I, I literally called my, our vet and over the radio and said, could you please come to the back of the building? Um, just as soon as you can. And she called me on my phone and said, is everything okay? I said, we have Komodo babies. And she came running. And so, you know, we got about looked at them and oohed and awed at them. And, you know, you know, they were running around. They looked really good from the get go. You know, they were just all over the place. So then, yeah, pretty much all the keepers in the zoo came in visited them that day. And yeah, you know, then we went, went, oh my goodness, now what do we do? So then I immediately set up a, a little house for them and they're still in that and they're doing great. They're growing like we. I was really amazed at even what they look like. Had I had never seen a hatchling Komodo dragon before. So when I saw the picture, had someone not told me it was a Komodo dragon, I never would have guessed. They actually have a lot more color and pattern, and they almost look more like a tree monitor rather than, than, uh, than a Komodo dragon when they're hatched. They absolutely do. Yeah, that was my first thought as well. I was used to only working with tree monitors to see these little skinny things that, you know, looked so narrow and to know they would become these big beasts of lizards. It was it was really amazing. They are starting to fill out a little bit more. Their heads are a bit bigger. And of course they've grown, but you know, now they're looking a little bit less like it. Their coloration, it's interesting because both Charlie and Cadal have the coloration, but it's muted over time. And of course they like to dig around in dirt. So they get a little filthy. Uh, but yeah, you could definitely see it more pronounced on the young ones. It's, uh, it, it was really amazing seeing that. But yeah, that's definitely a day I'll never forget. Are people able that come to the zoo able to see them yet? Or are they still kind of uh, in the back getting growing? They are still in the back, unfortunately. Yeah, we don't really have a great spot to show them on exhibit. Our smaller exhibits are just a bit too small to handle them. And then our bigger exhibits, well, they're currently housing something bigger. Um, and we can't put them in the outdoor one because, well, then we would never see them again. So we're trying to think of ways that we might be able to d display them in the near future, but we haven't come up with anything that works perfectly just yet. Although they are on Instagram. So if anyone wants to go look at them, there's definitely pictures there that they can see because they are really cool. So in terms of, do you guys know what triggered the partho? Like normally there's an environmental stress or, or maybe it was the stress of, of pairing them that, that triggered her to, to produce the parthenogenic eggs. You know, I do not know if they're, what exactly triggers that because I've, I've heard of it at other zoos where, you know, they have put theirs together. They didn't know if anything happened and then they find eggs and next thing you know, they do hatch. So I do believe that it's a, it's a pairing thing that just isn't successful. So the females just tend to say, well, we'll go ahead and provide for it then. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anybody's actually studied that. It's interesting. So are they all male then? I forget how this works. I, yeah, they are. Okay. Yeah. So I have worked with, uh, I worked with a Brazilian rainbow boa that actually had parthenogenic babies as well. Oh, wow. And oh, wow. in her case, hers were all female. So, and I've heard that for most parthenogenic species. So there's a gecko that's all females because they don't have any males of this species and they just do parthenogenic births. Those are all females. This is the only species I've heard of that it has only males when it's parthenogenic. Wow. That is. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, so what will happen with them? Eventually, you can't keep three males together, I'm sure. No, no. Um, eventually, what will happen is we will, we've been in touch with the SSP coordinator for this species and said, okay, we've got these three. We believe they're parthenogenic. What can we do? Being parthenogenic, they aren't quite as valuable genetically as would the ones from a full pairing. So they said, okay, well, once we test, get some blood from them and we test them for sure for the genetics, then we'll know. And like I said, we're reasonably sure that they are parthenogenic. But once we have that all figured out, then at that point, they're going to decide what zoos can take them and they will be sent to other zoos. In all likelihood, these would be sent to a zoo that isn't breeding them, but would have room to show one or two of them. And then down the road, they will go there and be happy little Komodos elsewhere. <laughs> And in, in terms of the current clutch that hopefully Charlie has uh, cooking inside her, 
what was the main differences between the breeding, the, the actual mating that ritual that went on? Like what were some of the, the things that made you guys think this may be more successful? Well, in this case, we were able to get very close and, and we saw everything uh, without going into too graphic of detail. Um, <laughs> and the first time that he caught her before, he would catch her and then just kind of sit on her and not really do much. Whereas when lizards do copulate, they do have to kind of be on each other, sort of facing one another in a way, um, sort of belly to belly, you might say. And we didn't see that before. And this time we did see it. And, you know, even without us being as up close and personal as we were, we actually could see them. He had her perfectly in place. Everything was uh, matched up with the way it should be. Wow. So at this point, are, would it be around Christmas again? You guys would be sort of looking for a clutch? That's what we're thinking. It should be. We did have them. We did have put them together a little bit later than we did last year. So. It might be around Christmas, maybe a little bit afterwards, but we're definitely keeping an eye on her. That is very exciting. What what makes it so difficult to to breed these animals? Is it mostly the size, or is there is other th- factors in play that make them challenging to pair? Uh, it's mostly the size, and then also the the possibility of the violence between the when they're paired. Um, I know that uh, from what I hear, other places when they've put them together, they see how they react to one another, another, and then they're just like, oh, no, we'll put them apart. We'll, we'll take them apart because obviously this is bad. And because you don't want to see your animal injured, or injured, of course. So right. as a result, they stop things too soon. And so it's probably harder because they don't, they don't want to see their animals get injured. You know, this it can look very bad. You know, females can get very torn up and bloody as, as a result of that. Now, admittedly, Komodos heal very fast and very well. So there's usually, it, as someone told me, it looks much worse than it actually is. And so we had to keep that in mind this time, but we didn't really need to worry about it too much as they were perfect. Yeah, I guess they are a pretty like tough as nails, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. And so I know that the LA Zoo is also working on some, commo- I was reading an article the other day about it because I guess, I don't know if you're familiar, there was, I think, was it, there's a female shortage of Komodo dragons currently in the States and they're trying to fix that by being able to sex the eggs uh, while they're still eggs, sex the embryos in the egg, and then they're actually terminating the male, the male embryos. Have you heard anything about that? I have heard of that. I don't know. I, I know that they're actually talking about when we do get eggs here that they want us to look into to doing that type of testing. I don't know anything about it beyond that. <laughs> so this will be a learning experience for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll be very cool. I mean, it's uh, it's th- that's one of the things that's amazing about zoos, and I know zoos. Depending on sort of what aisle, side of the aisle you're sitting on in terms of animal rights, a lot of people get upset about zoos. I'm not me, but but there's a, a fair chunk of people, and this is one of those perfect examples of of why it is important to have zoos. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree completely. It's without them, a you're not going to see what animals are out there, um, and b you know what if something should happen, we are the the final resort, you might say, to where these animals can still survive. The reason why there's still a few of the Sumatran rhino embryos around is because of zoos. They're extinct now. That's terrible. But with a zoo, there's a chance that those embryos down the road maybe can be turned into another Sumatran rhino. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much good a zoo can do. And do you have animals at home yourself or are you just all your animals is at work? I do have a few cats and a couple snakes. Um, I used to have quite a bit more, but my husband kind of said, you know, we don't really need all these animals. So now <laughs> I, I try not to rescue anymore. <laughs> yeah. Classic reptile story or person story. We end up having too many animals. Yep. Ha- has working at the zoo sort of changed your way you care for your animals at all? Oh, yeah. I look more at, you know, what can I do to, to enrich them, um, you know, beyond just, you know, feeding and handling and stuff. I look into, well, maybe I can make them a nifty exhibit and, you know, maybe I could give them some toys to play with or try something different. And I, because I've learned so much from zoos, I can make their habitats into something pretty amazing compared to what I used to be able to do. Yeah. I I mean, that's probably the best part about zoos is that the actual enclosures are like the gold standard. Like everybody wishes they could have a zoo level enclosure inside their home. Are there, are there any like small tips that you have, have uh, picked up from the zoo that you use with your animals? Um, you know, trying to keep things as natural as possible 
I think is the best tip I could give. You know, you look at where the animals come from in the wild. So, you know, you might have a ball python that's, you know, this weird morph that, you know, has never obviously seen where he comes from. Well, they're, they usually are found in burrows in the grasslands in Africa. So what would that look like and make that into your habitat for them? And I bet you're going to see some really interesting behaviors from this ball python rather than them just laying in a hide all day. So that's like the best thing I can tell anybody. Research your animal because you're going to find some really nifty things that you maybe didn't think of before. Yeah. I mean, that's a, I mean, if, for anybody listening, I did not tell Kate to say that. <laughs> that was totally <laughs> because that's something exactly that I've said so many times. And it's, it's the behavior that you get rewarded with. That's the amazing part. That is absolutely. And I'm sure at the zoo, you get that all the time. You get to watch these animals behave naturally. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you'll see them do things that you've never really thought that of an animal doing, but it's it's amazing. Uh, I can't even put it into words. <laughs> and you guys also had another successful breeding and uh, a hatchling just, I think, was that in the last couple of weeks or maybe last month with the uh, Roddy Island? Yeah, the snake yeah. turtles. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we actually obtained a female from um, Columbus Zoo. Well, we didn't have a male, so she actually had lived with a male prior to coming with coming to us, and apparently they did breed at some point there. So she came to us, and within about two months of her being here, she laid some eggs, and we said, well, we don't know if they're going to actually be good or if they, these are holdovers from when she was with that male. And so we got 11 eggs. Of those, five looked good. Um, one ended up not looking good about halfway through the the, the incubation process and we had to dispose of that one and now three have hatched and they look really good and then there's one more that we believe has died in shell so we will actually have to find out about that one but yes yeah, so we went from having one hatchling to three now and in fact the third one hatched just the day before yesterday oh so, wow yeah I, the article that i saw it was only the one so far yep yeah this is pretty new uh the second one hatched late early last week. And then yeah, the last one was day before yesterday. So, so that we'll have three little ones with huge heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They are definitely a interesting looking species. W was that the plan for them to like, did they know that she had a clutch of eggs on the way or was it just, they're sort of moving animals around to hopefully eventually produce a uh, healthy offspring? Um, it was more of a luck thing. Uh, we actually had brought her over with the thought of down the road getting a male for her for breeding. And when she came to us, they had told us, well, she was in with different ones and there may be eggs down the road, but we don't know for sure. And so we said, oh, OK, we'll see what happens. We'd still like to get a male for her down the road. They are an SSP species as well. So we would like to see to be a part of that breeding program. But in the meantime, we'll enjoy the three we have and see what happens to them down the road. Yeah, and, and I'm, they are a very, I think they're quite endangered in the wild. Yes, they are. Absolutely. So are those ones that will be on exhibit at some point too? Because they are obviously quite small. So you guys make sure they're healthy and eating and whatnot. Yeah, once we know they're healthy and eating, we'll look into seeing where we can actually display them. Um, that'll be a hard part. There's not too many displays that we have available right now, but we'll see what we can do because I would love to show them off. They're so cute. Yeah, that's yeah. They are super cute. It's it. They are hilarious looking. Almost, they have just such long necks and these huge eyes. And that's got to be one of the challenges with the zoo is you produce animals and you obviously don't want to move any of your animals. I'm sure you guys like all the animals that are in, at the zoo, but to make space and to make sure everybody can view them, you probably have to shuffle animals around. Oh yeah, and unfortunately, we don't have a huge amount of space behind the scenes here, so we have to kind of make do with what we have, and then. You know, really, we do look at other zoos going, OK, is there anybody available that can take this this animal? You know, we have some spotted turtles in the back that we hatched over the last couple of years and we'd be happy to send them off to other zoos as well. Uh, so we're just waiting for the plan on the, them. So, yeah, it can get a little uh, distracting. So we we try to make do and if worse comes source, we move stuff around. And, you know, if we have something that maybe has been on an exhibit for a while and maybe isn't wanting to hang out where people can see it as much, then we can move things around so the others, other animals can go on there in its place. Right. Yeah, I guess that's the other thing to keep in mind is that some animals actually probably don't like the amount of activity that's around in, in the zoo. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it, it may be not, not that they dislike it. It's just that they might be more nocturnal. So they're going to go find a 
quiet place to hang out during the day. And unfortunately, it's not as ideal to see them in. Right. So other than the Komodo dragons and the snake neck turtles, what other other animals are you caring for on a day-to-day basis? Oh, let's see. Well, we, we did also hatch some uh, some uh, Henkel's leaf-tailed geckos. So we have a few of those behind the scenes. But um, let's see. We have, like I said, some spotted turtles. We have Temistemas, which are an amazing crocodilian. Uh, we have three young ones on exhibit right now. Um, we don't plan on breeding those just because, well, they're all related first off. And second off, we certainly don't have the space to breed them. Um, then we also have a couple of Burmese pythons. Uh, numerous other snakes. We have Bushmasters, which are amazing. Um, you know, a couple puff adders, um, a gaboon viper, uh, a lot of horn lizards. We've done a lot of work with them and several different tortoise species as well. So we we have quite a distinct collection. We have a lot of different reptiles and amphibians here. And so it's, it's really cool. I was very excited to actually bring in a Sonoran desert toad recently uh, to our deserts building. So we have an amphibian in our deserts building, which is really neat to show off. Yeah, that's amazing. I, that must be just going to work must be so exciting. I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's work, there's things that you have to do that probably aren't the best, but getting to care for such a wide variety of animals must be amazing. Yeah, and it's like the saying, you know, have a job you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And it, I really do. I'm very lucky to have this career. I couldn't think of anything better. Being a zookeeper is a goal for so many people. Everybody, that's like the sort of the number one list for animal lovers when they're younger, especially. Do you have any advice for people that are trying to pursue that path? Um, it, I will say, first off, it's not an easy path to choose. I mean, there's a lot of keepers and not a lot of positions open for keepers. However, that being said, with enough hard work, it can be done. You do you want to focus on basically the sciences in school, you know, biological sciences are a big part of zookeeping because we do have to think about everything involved with these animals. We aren't just, as I say, shoveling poop all day. Uh, we do a lot more than that. Um, and then beyond that, you know, get, get experience, you know, if you can, while you're young, help out at a farm or something or anywhere, you know, volunteer at a, an animal shelter, helping to take care of the animals there. And, you know, a lot of zoos will say, well, we want, we want you to have paid experience to get a job with us. Well, that makes it a little difficult, but you know, you go through the, the round, you get your, your education done, you get your volunteering done. And then also once you have that intern at a zoo, if you do all that, there's a pretty decent chance that you can get a job as a zookeeper. But I, I will be honest in saying that it's not easy, but it's worth it. What, what is not easy about it in terms of the, the path or just the sort of the day-to-day work? Um, it's just the path, getting that job. Like I said, there's a lot of keepers, not a lot of positions. And unfortunately, right. you know, for an average zookeeper job, for one position, there might be more than 500 applicants. And that's just for a little, a little starter position. Um, and that being said, I, I will admit, it's also not the most high-paying of positions. It, there is no such thing as a rich zookeeper. <laughs> you know, we, we do this for the love. Yeah, so that's really what you need to demonstrate in those early years is that you're doing it for the love of the animal and you're also, you need to prove it's your, your worth to them. Like, how are you going to improve the zoo with, with the skills that you're bringing to the table rather than just wanting to play with cute animals? Yes, exactly. We, we don't sit there and hug on animals all day. I have had people ask me that. If that's what we do is just we play with the animals all day. I said, well, that would be lovely, but no. <laughs> we have to do the actual work involved with them first. <laughs> that's what's so interesting about that, that career is that you do get to do a lot of like these pairings and breeding, and you guys have a lot of responsibility in terms of the, the success of some of these species, and that's really amazing. It really is. Um, I had never known what was involved with that. And luckily I had a wonderful supervisor who was very encouraging and said, you know, you should get involved with doing these things because there are, you know, supervisors and curators and, you know, the upper level management, they are involved with doing all of this, the management of the animals, but there's no reason why keepers can't take part in doing the, the stud bookkeeping, the SSP programming, or even just being on general committees within the AZA or ZAA. Um, 
there, there's always opportunities to go above and beyond just caring for animals. Although some people, that's what they want to do. And that's fine too. Yeah, no, that makes sense. In terms of, obviously you're heavily involved with the reptiles and amphibians at the zoo. Are there other exhibits that you like to go visit on, a, on an occasional basis that are some of your favorites? Oh, I like them all. <laughs> um, I do truly love. I shouldn't to, ask to an animal. I, I, I shouldn't ask an animal lover that question. It's too general. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Now I, I will go and visit the Gibbons every day. I love chattering with them. Um, and I know it sounds very weird, but you know, visiting the goats in the petting zoo is always enjoyable too. I love goats. They're they're so much fun. But truly, I will go visit everything. Um, I like to see what's going on with the other animals. And I, when I first started as a zookeeper, I actually worked with carnivores. So, you know, I've been around the whole, the whole area and seen and worked with all the animals. So, you know, I get, I still want to visit. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. So what eventually, so you started with the carnivores, what eventually led you to the path of reptiles? Um, it was weird. So they had hired me on as a swing keeper. So I was going to work in multiple areas. And so they started me in the carnivore area and then next had me trained in hoofstock. And then one day uh, another keeper called out sick and they didn't have somebody to oversee their reptile area. So I said, well, you know what? I have some reptiles at home, so maybe I can help out. And as soon as I did that, then they said, huh, you have some experience here. Okay, well, we'll train you in here next. And then after a while, after I got trained in there, I was in there more often than not. And then it just became my area, so to speak. And yeah, I kept with that. So it was, it was a kind of a falling into, and I worked towards it down the road. <laughs> sure. And in terms of the carnivores that you were initially working with, are you talking like cats and bears? Um, we, we didn't have bears, sadly. That would have been cool. But um, yeah, mainly cats. I worked with lions, tigers, jaguars, and a few smaller cats, a little margay. It was, it was really cool. Oh, and snow leopards. Can't forget that. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I love snow leopards. W what is working with those guys like? Apparently, this is what I've heard is that large cats act just like house cats, except for they're massive. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. They they know that they could hurt you and they will take that chance to try to. Um, you know, and it's, you know, luckily we all do, you know, non no contact with the cats. Um, so as a result, they they pretty much do their own thing. But um, yeah, working with them, it was interesting. I, I had actually, my very first day of zookeeping was the day after tiger cubs had been born at Sacramento Zoo for the first time. And so I got to see them on my first day and I just went, oh my goodness, this is amazing. So, <laughs> you know, that was really, really neat. Um, but yeah, it was, it was definitely, it's different and similar. Um, yeah, they are like big house cats. They will act the same way. They will do what they want to do, you know, cause they're cats. Um, we used to have a, a male lion that would leave his door to go outside and he'd wait till the last second. And if you didn't start closing that door immediately, he'd whirl around, grab it with his paw and slam it back open. And if you were standing on the other side of that door, you would get hurt. He was the only one I was truly scared of working with because of that little trick. But other than that, I mean, you, you made sure you check your lock, and did everything right so that they were always on the other side of the fence. Um, but it was really interesting working with all the cats. Yeah, the, just the size of a big, you know, tiger or lion. You, you don't, you can't even tell how big they are looking at them through the TV and, until you see them in person. It's really impressive. Absolutely. And I love seeing that a lot of zoos now are getting away from doing the, the moat in between the animal and the people, but putting up like glass fronted uh, barriers so that the cats can be right there. And then you can really get an idea of how close these animals are getting to do that. It's, it's amazing seeing like kids see how big these animals are. It's just awesome. Yeah. It's their heads that always like blow me away. Like the size of a tiger's head is just unbelievable. Oh yeah, it is. Well, Kate, I really appreciate you joining me today. This was a really interesting conversation. I know people will learn a ton from just the life of a zookeeper in general, but also the Komodo dragon story. And I'm really looking forward to, to kind of keeping up to date with the eggs. Are, will, will Chattanooga Zoo Instagram page, will they mention anything about the eggs if you, if you guys do collect them? I hope they do. I will certainly let them know that they can, you know, put that on there. Um, ultimately, it's up to our supervisors whether they will say anything about it, but I'm thinking there's a good chance that we will say something. 
Yeah. So either way, people can keep up to date. Where, where can people find information about the zoo? Maybe if they want to visit there, if they're in, in the Tennessee area or online. We do have our webpage for the Chattanooga Zoo, uh, www.chatzoo. Um, you can come and visit us any old time. Um, just look us up on there or on Instagram. We have a Facebook page that's very active. We have a wonderful social media team. And so they will definitely keep everybody up to date on what we're doing with all of our events, with all our animals, with all of it. <laughs> Perfect. All right. That is awesome. Again, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. You are welcome. All right. That is the end of another episode. Thank you very much for listening. Kate, thank you so much for joining me and taking some time out of your very busy day at the zoo to chat with me. That was fantastic. And thanks to everyone else at the Chattanooga Zoo for helping organize the podcast as well as doing the amazing work that you're doing there. So I do encourage you at least to go check out Chattanooga Zoo on Instagram. And if you do happen to be in that area, go check the zoo out. It sounds fantastic. If I ever happen to be in the Tennessee area, that will definitely be at the top of my list. So before I wrap up today's episode, I did want to spend a few minutes talking about parthenogenetic births. Now, this is a topic that is A, highly interesting, and B, way above my biological understanding competence. So I'm not going to tread too deep into these waters um, because it will go over my head very quickly. But if you do want to learn more about it, you can scroll back a year ago to episode number 15 where I chat with Corey Imar from Toothless Reptiles. He actually produced the first DNA verified parthenogenetic clutch of water monitors. So he had he tells a story about how it happened and how they tested it and how they verified it. I think it was the first time this is ever scientifically verified. So it's really interesting. And of course, water monitors being closely related to Komodo dragons, it makes sense. Now, just as a bare bones description of how parthenogenetic births happen, essentially when your sex cells are going through meiosis, which you'll remember from your biology class, the cells are dividing and they are just left with half of the genetic information. So in humans, it's, it's simple to remember. Sperm has half of the genetic information and eggs have the other half of genetic information. And when they combine to create an embryo, you're creating all of the genetic information that's needed to create a human. Same thing with lizards, no difference there. The difference is, is when a parthenogenetic birth happens, you have just one female and she, her eggs are going through meiosis, which is the normal cellular process of continuing to produce cell sex cells. But for whatever reason, sometimes, whatever, I don't know if it's environmental or stress, parthenogenetic process gets triggered and it, the egg cells es essentially fertilize themselves. So you have egg cells that only have half of the genetic information. They fertilize each other and then go on to create a viable embryo. Again, that is as bare bones as it gets. I don't want to get into any details because I will mess it up and I will give you wrong information. But that's kind of how you can think about it. You basically have egg cells fertilizing each other because egg cells only do carry half of the genetic information necessary to make a viable animal. But the really peculiar thing here is that when Kate was mentioning the Komodo dragons, when they go through parthenogenetic birth, they only produce male offsprings. And then she had also mentioned that when she was working with a Brazilian rainbow boa that had parthenogenetic birth, it only produced female offsprings. So that is sort of... Uh, why is that happening? What is the difference between the two? So I went and did some reading to try to understand what this was. So you will remember from your bio class that males in our species have an XY sex chromosome makeup in our cells and our females have an XX. Now boas and pythons are the same way. We, we call females homogametic XX and males heterogametic XY. So what happens is when you have a female that goes through a parthenogenetic birth, she's taking X cells and only combining those with other X cells. So she has a cells that are going through meiosis that are carrying the X chromosomes and when they combine and fertilize each other, you're still only left with XX. Now on the lizard side, they have a different sex makeup when it comes to their sex chromosomes. They are the actually the exact opposite. The females are heterogametic, ZW, and the males are homogametic, ZZ. So when you're dealing with a female that's going through a parthenogenetic process, she's going to be taking either a W sex cell or a Z sex cell, combining those through the parthenogenetic process, as I had mentioned, they're sort of fertilizing each other. And she will either create offspring that are either ZZ or WW. Now ZZ will give you a healthy male or as healthy as you're going to be with a parthenogenetic birth. And WW creates an embryo that fails to hatch, which 
makes sense because as she was saying, typically when you're dealing with a parthenogenetic clutch, you're only going to be getting half or less viable embryos or viable hatchlings at the end of the day. And I'm guessing that is because half of those are WW embryos, which means they cannot develop to full term healthy baby Komodo dragons. So again, I'm stretching myself beyond my limits here. I don't want to go too far down that road, but I thought that was pretty interesting. So that, if you're wondering why there's a difference between the boas and the Komodo dragons, that's why. So anyway, that is the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring the show. I always appreciate your support. And if you are interested in an Animals at Home t-shirt or sweater, make sure you go to animalsathome.ca slash shop. $5 is donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. I will talk to you guys next time.